Oh, hey. What's going on, everybody? Today is Saturday. It's Saturday morning. It's time for Saturday morning time with Luke. And today I'm very excited because we're talking about something that's very near and dear to my heart. Microphones. Now, microphones don't seem all that exciting on the surface, but they are exciting and they're a very important part of our history. And if you really think about it, anything important since the 1920s that's ever happened has been recorded into a microphone and all of those microphones are famous now. So we're going to talk about the evolution of the microphone from the 1920s on. And there were microphones before the 1920s, but they were shit, right? So they're kind of irrelevant now. We're not even going to talk about anything before the 1920s. In the 1920s, that was the boom when we started uh, really uh, working in radio communications and broadcasting and we got some, some great minds working on our microphones and our radio broadcast technology. First things first, smoke them if you got them. All right. So, here's what we're going to do. I've prepared some slides for us. We're going to talk about some famous microphones throughout history and their design. We're just going to walk through the timeline. I had a difficult time um, organizing it because it's kind of, it's a difficult story to tell linearly throughout time because a lot of different things were going on at the same time. Because think about what's going on in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, right? We've got all these world powers. Everybody's just starting to catch on to radio as a thing, and newscasters are broadcasting. FDR is doing fireside chats addressing America publicly. So this was becoming a very big thing, and every world superpower was involved in it. Right, so if you think about the big ma microphone manufacturing companies, they all start out in like the 1920s and you have Neumann in Germany and you have RCA in America and we have Octava in Russia. And then uh, there's, who, who else is there? There's Schur in America working on microphones. All the world powers and all the world leaders wanted their voice to be the strongest, loudest, and most commanding voice. So they were commissioning scientists to make them microphones that would make their voices the best the presidential, right? So let's get into it. Let's pop over into my computer real quick. We're going to the desktop. We're going to talk through the computer, right? I'm going to go through all these slides. We're going to talk about the history. Then we're going to jump over there to the microphone table and we're going to talk about some of the microphones that I have, how they work, and uh, we'll do some tests about, you know, microphone placement and how they sound. Let's do it. Over to the desktop. Da, da, da. All right, so you see my desktop, and now you see my slides. Everything you ever needed to know about transducers. Now, every microphone is a transducer. A transducer is something that converts energy. So if you remember back to the first, uh, the first in this series, we were talking about the physics of sound and how sound is mechanical energy when it comes out of my voice and then we convert that energy using a transducer to electrical energy so that we can send it through the wire and to wherever it's going right so every microphone is a transducer but we have all sorts of different kinds of transducers that were made over history and the first one that we're going to talk about you're probably familiar with it's called um, a carbon microphone so the transducers were actually made with carbon. They, they ground, ground up carbon like, a, um, like chalk dust, not chalk dust, like coal dust, and they put it between two uh, plates. And when the mechanical waves uh, hit the carbon, it would create voltage spikes between those two plates. And that's how carbon mics worked. And these were used really in the, uh, in the beginning of the telephone. Well, not just the beginning, but all throughout our old telephones, the, um, the heavy ceramic ones that you could screw the capsule off, those were carbon microphones. Um, and they're still used today. If you buy a phone like that, there's still a carbon microphone in it. Some of the earliest um, famous mics, like the, the King's mics, if you ever saw that movie, The King's Speech, about, uh, what king was it? King Henry the 
fifth, maybe? I don't know. Making it up. One of those kings, though, he had a stutter, and he worked with vocal coaches and stuff, and they made microphones to try and make his voice sound more commanding, more leadership-worthy. Those uh, were some famous carbon mics. Uh, let's take a look. Let's, let's move on to our first slide here. Before we talk about the mics themselves, I want to just go over these polar patterns really quickly. It looks like you're not able to see me right now, so let me fix that first. Why can't you see me? Tell me, can you see? Mm, tell me, can you see? Tell me, can you see? Mm, 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 mm. I just bounce my camera here just in case that's what's up. We don't need it, but it would be nice to be able to see my. Doop. And then let's go to. Bum, bum, bum. Here we are. Here I am back speaking to the people just like FDR. So let's go over these polar patterns really quick. Let's just make me a little smaller so you can see the whole slide. Cool. The first one here, we have empty. Don't worry about these too much. They're, they look confusing, but they're not. So imagine you're a microphone and you're in the middle of this circle. The polar pattern here refers to the area that the microphone's gonna pick up, right? So if you're in an omnidirectional polar pattern, like all these early mics were, um, then it picks up the sound from all sides, even behind it, right? Then this is good if you're going to put a mic on a table with a bunch of people around it or a, a live music performance and you want to pick up a bunch of performers, that might be what you want. But if you're trying to do a rock band on stage, you can't have everybody using a mic like this or you just get loud squelching feedback, right? Because all the mics would be picking up all the other mics and all the speakers blasting the music back. So that, this would be bad for that application. Then we have subcardioid, which is almost omnidirectional, but it rejects a little bit at the very back, right? So there are some mics that have this kind of a polar pattern. This is probably the most um, ubiquitous now. This is what you're going to see. This is what the Shure SM57 is, the mic that you talk into most frequently and is most replicated. It's the cardioid pattern, and it's named cardioid because it kind of looks like a heart. Right? So it rejects sound very well from behind it, which is why people use it on stage all the time. It's because the, mon the speakers and the other band members on the stage aren't getting picked up. And that's great. And then they get tighter and tighter as we go. So then we have super cardioid, which is a little bit even more directional. So it's rejecting more from the sides and from the back and hypercardioid a little bit more even, right? And then we get to figure eight, which is interesting. Because figure, figure eight mics are around today and they had a pretty practical purpose. These pick up sound from the front and the back of them. So think if you had two singers, if you were doing a duet and you put up a, a, a figure eight mic between them, you would pick them both up equally from that microphone. So there's some good reasons to use this kind of a, a polar pattern. And then there's the shotgun polar pattern. And this is a relatively new one. And this is what you see people like filmmakers using when they do documentaries and they have the really long mic that's pointed right at the person they're interviewing. Look at what it's rejecting. That's so you don't get the sound of you know, the crowd around the person. You just get the sound of exactly what you're pointing at it. And maybe a little bit of what's behind too, because that's just a, a byproduct of the mic rate. So those are general polar patterns, and I wanted to talk about them first because they're inherent to the design of some of these microphones. So I just wanted you to be aware of them. Also, vacuum tubes. These are a big thing in, in these types of early electronics, and even now in the vintage market. Guitar players use vacuum tubes in their amplifiers. We have vacuum tubes in um, microphones and electronic, like, phonograph stuff and stereo equipment, definitely in radio communication and like ham radio, amateur radio stuff, there's still tubes around. And what tubes were is these are just kind of, um, they're actually a spin-off on the light bulb. So Edison's working on the light bulb and he realized that when he, the light bulbs were breaking, it was charring up one area of the top of the light bulb where, where, the, uh, where the bulb started to break, right? And he kind of got an idea that the, the vacuum in the light bulb, when it broke, all the electrons were shooting in one direction, making like a direct current. And somebody, somebody else, not Edison, took that idea and, uh, and developed it and came up with this. 
and this is a vacuum tube. So the way this thing works is it's heated and there's a grid placed around it, right? This grid is made of metal and we electrify the grid. So if you plug your electric guitar into a tube amp, the amp itself is applying heat to the tube to, to, activate, to activate it, right? That's why it lights up and looks cool. And then the sound from your pickup, the signal, the electricity from your guitar pickup is going to this grid. And that, those voltage spikes on the grid are, uh, are then opening and closing this valve, right? So if you think of a vacuum tube, it's really like a valve, like a plumbing valve. It's just turning a signal on and off and on and on and on and off. Right? And it's doing that based on the electricity, the voltage that we send to the grid inside it. So this is how a vacuum tube, tube works. It converts AC current, alternating current, that's going in two directions, to a pulsating DC current. So it's only going in one direction, but it's going in pulses, right? Zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Um, we use them to amplify sound. It makes sound louder. That's why vacuum tubes are in things like amplifiers. Uh, they're used in everything, radio, television, guitar amps, all, all over the place. You can still find them, but they're difficult and expensive, right? Because tubes were very popular during, like right before World War II. And I think World War II kind of obliterated a lot of the manufacturing and the stockpiles of tubes that we had. And they became more and more expensive and more and more difficult. They degrade over time. They're, um, they're made of glass, glass breaks, right? So these were kind of inefficient. They also use a lot of electricity. They made a lot of noise. They're, some of that we like, like in a guitar amp, we like the tube noise. It sounds good, but not in every application. And... Um, they were used primarily in everything up until about 1947 when we invented the transistor. The transistor kind of effectively replaced vacuum tubes functionally and much cheaper and in a way that was um, easy to mass produce and uh, easy for people to get their hands on. All right, so let's talk about these carbon microphones I alluded to. Now the carbon microphones were popular in around 1920 when the telephone was coming out. This is what they looked like. And there was actual carbon in here, like a carbon dust. The microphone used two plates separated by the dust. And as uh, a speaker, me, would move the air in front of the first plate, it pushes all the dust around and that would change the magnetism between the two plates. And that change is what we, uh, what we would send down the wire as the sound signal. They generated a really low voltage. They were really noisy. These kinds of speakers, um, microphones rather, weren't that great. They, you can still find them. You can still buy a phone like this that has this, but it sounds like that phone. You know the sound. It's thin and it's not the whole frequency spectrum and it's scratchy and it's just not very good, right? It was fine for phone communication at the time, but even now we wouldn't really accept that kind of clarity. In the King's Speech, if you saw that movie, one of these microphones was actually a carbon microphone. Um, I think one was made in the 20s and then the other two here, these are the real royal microphones. These were made uh, as condenser microphones later down the line because that technology became available. But this is a pretty famous carbon mic you probably saw on TV. Here, let's move on now. Ribbon microphones were also introduced in the 1920s. Now, a ribbon microphone sounds a lot different. It's made a lot different. It had a ribbon inside it. And as you speak, you move the ribbon, which is kind of the same. It's like a replacement for the carbon um, between two magnets. And the magnetic relationship would change between those plates with the ribbon moving. And that generates our voltage to send down the wire into our speakers or our recording stuff or whatever. So they had a thin conductive ribbon between these two magnetic poles. But the thing is in the 1920s, our manufacturing wasn't very good. These things were iffy at best and they were, um, they were unreliable. If a gust of wind hit the ribbon on one of these, it might stick to the magnet on one end and then your mic's broken, right? And they weren't cheap. So these were very fragile and, um, and they got better over time. The first ones were not good. Ribbon mics, by their design, 
are bidirectional. So if we think about our polar patterns that we talked about in the very beginning here, they're this figure eight pattern just because of the way that they're made. So you can speak into either end of them and get the same kind of signal. Maybe one might be a little brighter or darker, but they're both accepting the same amount of sound from, from either end, right? So this is the polar pattern of all ribbon mics. That's just how they're made. They were very fragile and they have a strong high frequency roll off. So they made things sound warm and smooth and velvety. That's, this is the sound of the crooners that you uh, might think back to, right? This is that very thick and, um, and croonery sound. These are still made and they're still in use. And uh, even on modern mics that have adjustable polar patterns, these are a viable option and, um, and they have a purpose, right? So. You might come across ribbon mics. I don't have one. I want one, but I, I haven't been able to justify it. Now, condenser microphones came along in the 1920s, and these are the ones that we probably use most now. A condenser microphone is in your phone, for example, the one in your laptop that we're doing video conferencing with. All these little tiny microphones that we have in all our devices, these are condenser microphones. And so are the big tubey ones that um, you see like Bono singing into in recording studios. Those are condenser microphones. And they work, um, they have these two plates and there's a, a conductive diaphragm between the plates and we apply voltage to the diaphragm. Now they make the diaphragm out of whatever's cheap, <laughs> right? And then they plate it with something that's conductive, usually gold. Um, so condenser microphones have this diaphragm, two plates, and they're very tough, rugged, easy to switch around and do stuff with. They're not super, super um, fragile. Now they were invented by Western Electric, but they didn't get very good until after World War II. Now, all of the, these bits that, uh, that make up the condenser microphone here are referred to as the capsule. And a lot of times these capsules were replaceable and manufacturers could um, mix and match capsules with their, the rest of their mics. So there are some microphones where you can just change the capsule and it changes the character of the microphone and that's a cheap way to get different sounds. So I just wanted you to know about that. Now this design requires some kind of power to operate. So they had, in, in, in early times, they had their own power supplies. You, they would plug into something that would apply voltage to this thing, right? But now we have phantom power, which is um, we're able to send a 48 volt signal up the microphone cable itself to apply power to the microphone. And that's all it needs. So it's, it's a good, cheap option today. Now we're gonna start talking about some specific mics as they started to come out and how they changed history. So this is the Neumann bottle, right? This, this was manufactured by George Neumann. Um, it was the first mass produced condenser microphone. So people before him, Western Electric, really figured out how to make it. And then Neumann figured out how to turn it into something that we, was buildable and saleable and reliable. And people loved the Neumann bottle, especially Hitler, a guy called Hitler. Hitler loved the Neumann bottle. They called it the Hitler bottle, right? And he put a lot of money into R&D for Neumann and the other microphone manufacturers and radio companies at the time because he wanted his voice to be heard, right? So uh, the Third Reich invested a lot into microphone technology during the war and right before the war. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I mean, it really depends on how you look at it, I guess. Everything got bombed in the war, so they lost a lot of work, right? Um, uh, not talking about human rights here. I'm talking about microphone technology. They, they lost a lot of the tubes. They lost a lot of the knowledge, and they lost a lot of their plans, and just a lot of this got set back by the war, like every other industry, I'm sure. Now, um, the Neumann company itself... This was a pretty successful microphone. People liked it, but Neumann was firebombed and lost the whole factory in 1947. Um, so they kind of dropped off for a little bit and had to regain their, their footing. 
So this was in 1928. We get our first mass-produced condenser microphone. Oh, my slide's not moving. Come on. Move. Now, let's talk about dynamic microphones for a second. They work a little differently from condensers and um, ribbon microphones and carbon microphones. Now, the first dynamic mic in production was this Western Electric 618A electrodynamic transmitter. Uh, it was omnidirectional, meaning if, if we look at the polar pattern sheet, it picked up sound from all different sides. That's not how we think of them today, generally. It was patented by Siemens and produced by Western Electric. And it was the standard 1930s news mic. This is what the news was read to you on. You see these with different, like NBC, CBS, whatever. Um, these were the mics that the newscasters were using. So this was one of FDR's fireside chat mics. So he would put this on his table. He was the first one to like take control of the radio and use it to address the people in America. I don't know if other countries were doing that at the time. They probably were. But for us, FDR was the, the guy that was like, the radio is pretty cool. I want to talk directly to the people. I can talk in this microphone and then they're going to hear it on their radios and that is dope. And he was right about that. That is dope. So, um, so he used one of these early dynamic microphones. Dynamic microphones work differently because they take the mechanical energy and they hit the diaphragm and they move the diaphragm and that movement, the mechanical movement, is changing the, um, the magnetic relationship and creating the voltage that we need to go down the, the wire, right? That it's, there's no power involved here. It's not assisted by a pickup or a, um, uh, well, we'll use a preamplifier later down the line to turn the signal up, but we don't need any power to make the signal itself. Right? It's using a low enough volt. It's creating a high enough voltage rather to go down the signal um, chain without assistance. It does this by moving a coil physically. Here's another slide of those uh, the King's Speech microphones. So I put this later in the slide deck here because, as we said, the first one of these. This one for King George V in 1925. This was a carbon microphone, like a telephone. And look how ornate it is. I mean, this is all gold and jewels and crazy. These are the royal family's mics. These are real mics, and, uh, and we'll never get to speak into them. But this first one here was a carbon microphone. And then after that, they had uh, the dynamic microphones, the moving coil microphones. So now we have these moving coil microphones, and Queen Elizabeth gets one, and so does King George VI. Right, so you can see the royal family was changing with the times too. So these microphones were specifically designed for the people that were speaking into them. So they took account of the characteristics of their voices and they moved the coils around and tuned things so that it would make them sound the way they wanted to sound. Now today we have software companies that actually create tools where you can take whatever microphone you have and run it through their software and it claims to model the tonal characteristics of these rare old beloved microphones. So that's an option today that's new that we never had before. You can take any mic and make it pretend to be another mic. It's crazy. Here we have in 1938, this is Orson Welles. He's talking into an American RCA ribbon mic. So you've seen pictures like this before. This was a ribbon mic. Mm -mm 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 so now that we've got the dynamics, this comes along and kind of changes everything for everyone. This is the Shure Unidyne 55. You've seen it. This is Elvis's preferred mic. He used it all the time. They call it the Elvis mic. Um, and it's been around for a long time. This is a dynamic microphone. It was recognized by the IEEE as a key invention of the 21st century. This was the world's first unidirectional mic that had a single capsule like this. So this was the first mic that you could point at somebody and only get that one person, which became very important for broadcasting because imagine you have three people that are talking in a studio 
every mic was picking up all three people and that was terrible. Now you can have control over each individual speaker and they can mix those signals. Like if one person speaks louder, you can turn that person down. And if one person's a little mousy, you can turn that person up. So that's a big deal. Um, so this is the Shure Unidyne 55 and this is the mic that it's evolved now, but this is what we know now is the SM57 and the SM58. They, they are actually Unidynes. They come from the same capsule. So this really revolutionized, revolutioni revolutionized music and recording and broadcasting. Uh, it was priced at $45 when it came out, which is about 800 bucks today, similar to a decent mic that you're gonna get priced today. It was a favorite mic of Elvis, Sinatra, Billy Holiday, Hank Williams, everybody at the time used these. These were amazing. Um, so this is the Shure Unidyne 55. It looks cool, right? Um, I was watching some YouTube video and a guy was wondering where they got the design from and um, I don't know. This is a 1937 Oldsmobile Coupe 6. So you tell me. It's pretty cool. I will say that. Um, that is neat. Now, now we've got these things and these are awesome and everybody's starting to use these things. And in 1947, we get the transistor and the transistor is a big deal. The transistor is responsible for life as we know it today. Our computers and our cell phones and all of our electronics and every microphone we use it. Like everything's a transistor now. And they get smaller and smaller and cheaper and cheaper and more and more powerful. So transistor is a big deal. This changes history. So Bell Labs invented it in 1947. Life was way different before we had the transistor. Semiconductors, this is how they work. Semiconductors are like silicone. They're not as conductive as a conductor would be. So not as conductive as copper, but they're not as insolent as like rubber. So they're somewhere in between. And we take advantage of that by making it as conductive as we want it to be by injecting stuff. Um, we call it doping. So you can take some other, uh, I, don't, I don't know what they use to do it with, but they inject these with another chemical to make them more or less conductive. It's crazy. And they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So there's no moving parts in these things. Like this is what's replacing the old vacuum tubes, which were expensive and confusing and hard to make and fragile and noisy and just kind of a pain in the ass, right? And now we've turned that into this and it has none of that stuff. It's silent. It's made of silicone and nothing moves. It doesn't break, right? It's tiny. We use this to amplify weak signals. Now this is functionally replacing those old tubes and that's a good thing for microphone technology because it means that we can uh, make smaller microphones because right? we don't have to put a tube in them. There's over a hundred million transistors in your cell phone and some other crazy amount in the billions in your laptop. So that's how small they are. And we have this law here, it's called Moore's Law, and it states the number of transistors on a microchip, like a, like a circuit board, um, or a chip on a circuit board, doubles every two years, and the cost of those chips will cut in half about every two years. That's a crazy thing, and we're definitely living through that if you think about the, the rise of the computer industry, the information age. Like, this is nuts, and it's not stopping. So this is a big deal and it changes the way that microphones happen, right? Now, now this is after the war. Neumann's been bombed. Everybody's recovering. Um, there's a lot of radio gear that's hitting the market now because people have figured it out and there was a lot of investment from the war in radio technology. So after the war, a lot of that was sold off to, to people and to radio stations and to causes and to other countries. Um, and what happens while well, there's this little kind of rift is AKG starts up in Austria. So Neumann's got the Neumann bottle, right? And that's a pretty popular microphone. But they're re-getting their footing after their whole factory's bombed. And they're, they're setting up a new factory in Berlin now to make new microphones. And AKG pops up in Austria and makes this capsule. It's also a condenser capsule. And it became what we know now as the C414. So this is the C414. You see this mic in broadcasts and stuff on TV. I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, this is its evolution over the years. Right, and the, the thing that was different about this mic than the condensers we had at the time is it was made to be clean. 
the the all the microphones up until now were all colored. They were all very charactery. So they had their own noise. They had their own uh, warmth. The tube warmth was added to them. Neumann's had some EQ boosts and cuts in it, and they all were designed to make the speaker sound better than the speaker sounded. Then AKG comes along and is like, well, we need a microphone that is clean. We need a microphone that's capturing the actual sound of what we're recording, right? It's a different purpose. And this was a big deal. So that's how we get the C414 in 1953. Well, we got the, the C12 capsule for it in 1953, and then it became this, it looks like in 1980. We got the form factor we know and love today. All right, so back in America, Shores uh, still innovating. They had that wildly successful Unidyne 55, the Elvis mic that people are still using and loving. And they've taken that capsule and turned it into something that can leave the studio. So they made what was called the SM56. There was one before the 57. SM stands for studio microphone. And the 56, it looked identical to the 57. This has been used by every US president since 1966, right? If you go to an open mic, there's a good chance you're playing your guitar into an SM57 or an SM58. Um, these are everywhere. They're cheap and they last forever and they're everywhere. Now, they didn't sell well at first though. When they first put them out, they weren't selling well. They weren't ideal in the studio. They were good on snare drums and stuff, but they hadn't figured out that the, the real great application for these was in live like stage performances where you needed that tight rejection and everybody could have their own mic and be up real close to it and be really loud into it and reject all the other sounds on the stage. And when people started to figure that out, this thing went nuts. And uh, they, there was actually one story that I came across. Shore donated a bunch of them to the Beatles for one of the Beatles tours. And the deal was, after the tour, the Beatles were gonna return the microphones and they were gonna auction them off for charity. And well, the tour ends and Shore never gets the mic back, so they call up the Beatles managers and they're like, what the hell, where's our mics? And they say, hey, we, we sent them back, I don't know what the problem is. And the problem turned out to be that the band's management sent back the microphones in an unmarked box and the mailroom just threw them out. So <laughs> those little bits of history, gone, and that auction didn't happen. That's too bad. I bet, though, if you ever find that box with the SM57s, like in a landfill or something, I bet they still work. That's the thing about 57s. So they've been proven to be roadworthy and rugged. And a part of one of their main characteristics in SM57 is there's a little boost in the, in the frequency response of it around, I think it's like five or six, maybe even 3K. I don't remember where it is. It might be 3K, around 3000 Hertz, I'm gonna say. And that, um, it sounds good on a lot of things. It sounds good on electric guitar. It sounds good on a lot of people's voices. Uh, and we've come to know and love that sound on certain instruments. Like if you hear a guitar, an electric guitar that's been microphoned, that's been mic'd in a studio on a recording, is probably mic'd with an SM57. They shine there. So this is the SM57. Now, shortly after that, they came out with the SM58, which is basically the same thing, it's just got that windscreen on it. Um, I've got some over on the mic table, we're gonna look at the difference after I get through these slides. So this is the SM58, comes out in 1966. It was $81 at launch. I think it's like $91 today, so it hasn't changed much. They only sold 145 of them in the first year. So this microphone was not a big hit. They were gonna give up on it. The broadcast industry didn't like it. The recording industry didn't like it. They couldn't figure out what to do with it. And then they figured out that live performance. Boom, that's the way to go. Then it picked up. Now, Neumann gets back on their feet in 1967. Their factory was firebombed during the war. They come back in Berlin, they have a new factory, and they make this. Well, they made a few microphones before that did well, but this is the one that, that stands today, right? This is the microphone, the gold standard for vocals in the industry for the last 30 years, still today. The, the Neumann U87. So, um, 
1960, Neumann introduced the U67, which was a tube condenser. It used the vacuum tubes, and that's also beloved. People still covet those, and they're still on the market. You, there's a vintage market for them. So this was an important mic, too. Um, but then they replaced it when the transistor came out with the U87. So now they could do the same thing with transistors, and they've got this. It included a FET, a field effect tech transistor. FET circuitry, and it could be powered by 48 volt phantom power, which is very different. Up until this point, we needed, uh, we needed power supplies. They, every condenser mic had its own physical power supply. And now we could send the power through the mic cable itself and power these mics, and that's a big deal. So this mic was beloved, everybody loved it, it sounds amazing. And you can still find it in every world cl class recording studio. If you're an A-list um, uh, musician and you go into a studio and they don't have a U87, you, you're probably not even in that studio, right? That's just how ubiquitous they are. This was used by the Beatles on nearly every track they sang from 1962 to 1970. This was a big deal. It's about $4,000 today. You can still buy them. They've been revised a few times. They're not the same as they were back then, but they're the same. Uh, in 1968, now we get this mic, which is kind of kind of tailored for broadcasting. This is the Electro Voice RE20. In 1968, they introduced this as a dynamic mic, and it was useful for radio broadcasters. This very quickly became a standard because look at it, right? It, it just makes sense that this is going to be what you're going to use in a radio. So the, the thing about this mic is it had a low proximity effect. So we haven't talked about the proximity effect yet, but we will. Just briefly, the proximity effect is a, a phenomenon where you take a dynamic microphone and you get really, really close to it. It accentuates the low frequencies in, the, in your voice. So it makes you sound deeper and lower than you really are. This particular mic didn't do that just by the way that it was designed. So that was interesting. They had other mics that radio people were using, but this was different. Then later, they realized that we could also use this type of mic for something like a kick drum, because you can be really loud in front of it without breaking it, and it wasn't going to do anything to that signal. It wasn't going to make it sound boomier and muddier than it really was, because there's no proximity effect. So prior to this, they were using the SM57s and stuff. This is still sold, you can still buy it. I think they're like five, six hundred bucks. Now in 1973, Shure responds and we get this baby. This is the Shure SM7, it's now the SM7B. You can still buy this today and it's like 350 bucks. So this mic is similar to the Electro Voice one we just looked at, but it does have the proximity effect. Um, it has a really low amplitude, so you have to be loud into it and you need a really strong preamp to turn it up. So, so that makes it a, a little more difficult to use than something like a SM57, but it, it really shines in a broadcast type application. So the radio industry loves this mic. This is what you're gonna see on Joe Rogan's podcast or, uh, or um, Rush Limbaugh or whoever, whatever radio person you, Howard Stern, whatever radio person you listen to is probably talking through one of these. Right, it, this has been used on so many hit songs, we can't name them, but the big one is Thriller. So this is Michael Jackson's Thriller mic. When we're talking about the Neumann, you know, everybody loves this mic and for good reason. This mic cost $4,000. And in 1973, Michael Jackson chooses to use this $350 microphone to make Thriller the highest selling record in the country or in the world or whatever. I don't, I don't know. But it was a big deal, right? 350 bucks. You can buy it at Guitar Center today. Now, speaking of today, here's an example of a microphone. Microphones haven't really changed that much since the 40s and 50s. Here's an example from today, though. This is the Lewitt LCT940. It was introduced in 2012, and look what they've done. So, Lewitt's made this mic. They put a tube in it, and they want you to know that, right? So they made it very clear that there's a tube in this thing. And it's also got the FET transformers. So this also has transistors in it. So you can mix and match between those two sounds and you can dial in the tube noise and warmth if you want it, or you could dial it back if you want a different sound. So that's kind of where we're at. We're innovating on the microphones that have come before, but we're not really making something new here, right? That's where we're at. 
Now, if we want to talk about something crazy, we have some software solutions. <laughs> this is called microphone modeling technology, and this blows my mind. So a lot of these old mics, like those Kings mics, um, you're never going to get a chance to use those mics. Even, even if you could go into wherever they keep the crown jewels or whatever and talk into that mic, you're not, it's not useful to you, right? So this allows us um, to take the characteristics of some of those microphones. So Abbey Road Studios, for example, was able to work with the royal family and use those mics for a little while to model their characteristics. So they recorded a bunch of stuff with the mics and then they looked at that signal and they were able to, or they claimed they were able to, um, capture just the things about that microphone that are unique to the microphone so that you can apply that then to something in software. So here's an example of doing that. Um, what they do is they call this process profiling and the, the earliest use of it that I, I'm familiar with is with uh, reverb. So very early on in audio processing, there's this thing called impulse response reverb and they'll go to like a, a famous hall and set up some fancy purpose-built microphones and just clap their hands or something. And then all the microphones record how long it took all the sounds to get back to the microphones. And using that information, they can put it all into, you know, they just look at the data and they can later apply that information to a sound signal and make it sound like it came from that room. It's nuts. My um, guitar processor here does the same thing. So if I have an old amp, I can take a microphone and mic up that amp and then it'll set me through, it'll say, you know, play this and then play this and then play this. And then at the end, boom, it's profiled that amplifier. And now I could sell the amplifier and I still have the sound, right? I can plug my, my guitar into this machine <laughs> and I can dial back that amplifier that I took a profile of and apply it after the fact. So that's what we're doing now with microphones. So they're taking profiles of these microphones and then applying it to the sound signal after the fact, which is nuts. So there's a bunch of software companies that make software like this. This is T-Rex. I used this just to test it out. I, I never used it for a practical application, but it's kind of cool. And uh, some microphones even have this built in, this type of tech. So that's crazy. And that's where we're at with sort of a quick history of microphones. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to hop over to the microphone table. And I'm going to show you the mics that I have. We're going to listen to them. And it's going to be groovy. Uh, before we do that, though, before we go to the break, I'm going to run for you a promo video that, um, that my buddy Rob Madsen and I made a while back. Now, we were thinking about making YouTube review videos about different microphones and comparing them and shooting them out and the cheap one versus the expensive one and which one should you buy. So we did this on condenser microphones. So I'm going to run that for you so you can see a quick example of the low end, the mid range, and the higher end, um, and how they sound together. All right, so let's run that, and then we're going to take a quick 15 minute break, and then we're going to be back to the microphone table, all right? Here we go. All three mics have different costs and different things going for them. The first mic we're going to look at is an MXL 67 Heritage Edition. This mic is a more of a cosmetically attractive version of the very well respected 67G. The next mic is going to be a brand new mic from Tech Audio Products. It's the Stellar X2. This microphone was just released and it's being compared and modeled after the famous U87, the classic version. And finally, a Neumann, the Neumann TLM 102. The TLM-102 is the little brother of the TLM-103 used by a lot of voiceover artists. It's smaller in stature, but still packs quite a punch. Looking at these three mics, we're going to compare them by price, feature set, durability, the sound, and finally, do they make you want to use them? And also, when people walk into your studio, what are they going to think? Let's take a look from the lowest cost to the highest. The lowest cost is the MXL 63 Heritage Edition. This is available on Amazon and BNH and other sources for about $100. And it's a great mic for people starting out in the voiceover world. The next up is the newcomer, the Stellar X2, available for about $200, also just on Amazon for now. And finally, the Neumann, available 
pretty much anywhere great mics are sold. And it runs from anywhere from $550 up to $700. When you pick these mics out of their cases, how do they feel? Do they feel durable like they'll last you a long time? Well, from the top end, the Neumann, it's built like a tank. It's something that feels like it'll last for years and years, even if you knock it around a little bit. The Stellar X2 is pretty close. Again, all metal construction just like the Neumann, and feels incredibly durable. And it comes with a few extra things in its box that the Neumann doesn't. And finally, the MXL. Don't get me wrong. It's a solid mic, but it doesn't quite come up to the build quality standards of the other two. If you take good care of it, it'll last you for a long, long time. But if you throw it in your bag and it's knocking around, it's probably going to be the one that's going to give up the ghost the quickest. When it comes to the feature set, all of these mics are pretty equal because they all are cardioid microphones. No multiple polar patterns. They all work pretty much the same. None of them have buttons for a high pass filter or a dB boost. They're all pretty standard. You plug them into the XLR port and you're good to go. Remember, if you're using any of these mics, you're going to need an audio interface to connect to your PC. And when it comes to what comes in the box, the interesting thing is the most expensive mic is the most simple. It comes in a standard cardboard box, it comes with a clip, and that's it. The X2, the Stellar, that comes with a shock mount and also with a foam pop filter. And the lowest price mic comes with the most stuff. This MXL 67 Heritage comes with a shock mount and also this built-in pop filter made out of metal. It's probably the most attractive mic when you look at it, even though I have to admit, I do like the Stellar X2's black look and the Neumann is a classic. So they all look pretty good sitting on your mic stand. When it comes to the sound, they're all good. You can get a great recording out of all of them and probably after you EQ them, you can get fairly even sound. But I have to admit, the MXL doesn't seem to capture quite the detail of the other two. The Stellar X2 is a hotter mic and it carries it captures a lot of great detail. But it also captures the room a little bit more, so you have to be a little more careful. There's something magic about the Neumann. The 102 does a great job capturing detail, but it seems to reject some of the external sound even for a condenser microphone. And if I had to take one of them, it would probably be the TLM 102. And finally, what makes you want to use it more? And if people walk into your studio, what's going to make them think that you're a pro? Well, the Neumann is something that when you hear your voice in the headphones, when you're speaking it to them, again, it has a certain magic quality. Great detail. It makes you sound like you're a pro. And when people walk into your studio and they see a Neumann or you tell them, well, I'm going to be recording you on a Neumann, well, you're probably going to get people in the know saying, oh, that's great. I know you're giving me quality gear to work with. The Stellar X2... Well, it's a new kid on the block, and I think it's a really great quality mic, especially for $200 versus a $700 Neumann price. Great detail. It does capture a little bit more of the room, and you're probably going to have to be a little more careful with your settings, but I think you can get a phenomenal sound out of it. And if you're on a budget, all isn't lost, because the MXL 67 Heritage not only looks great in front of you, but it sounds great. I think it captures a little bit less detail than the other two and probably a little less bass out of the voice. So if you're a male voice and you're trying to get that kind of commanding sound, well, probably the other two are going to do a little bit better job. Maybe if you have a lighter voice, if you're a tenor, or if maybe if you're recording a woman, it might sound a little bit better. And also, when people walk in and see this mic, they're not going to think you cut corners. It looks fantastic. But people in the know might say, MXL, that's kind of a consumer-level microphone but I think it punches above its weight. Well, you're going to decide because you've been hearing all of these different mics over the course of this recording. You can decide what sounds right for you. And there's no, there's really no substitute for actually getting a mic and trying it out yourself. So if you have a friend who has one, borrow it. See how it sounds for you. That's it for today. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe. So we're going to have more things coming out. Hit that like button. Let people know about us. It's going to be a wild ride of great best on a budget reviews. Thanks a lot. See you soon.
Here we are. I haven't spoken to you over here before. We're at the studio couch. And I've got a bunch of microphones set out here. So we're going to talk about the microphones a little bit, and then we're going to listen to them all. And that's going to be pretty neat. So right now, I'm speaking to you on what's called a lav or a lapel mic. I have over there plugged into um, my, my hardware, I have one end of this wireless microphone system. And in my pocket, I have the other. So this is using a wireless signal to transmit my voice over to the computer where it's getting sent to you. So this way I'll be able to speak to you and we can use the other inputs that we went over last week um, to demonstrate some of these microphones. Let's take a look at some of them though and their design first. So first, let's talk about the one that we all know and love. This is the Shure SM58, right? Everybody has, I don't wanna say everybody has one, but these are very, very, very popular. So they're inexpensive um, and they're easy to get and they last a long time and they're perfect for most of the things that we do, right? If you could only have one mic in your arsenal, this would be the one that I'd recommend because you can do almost everything with it. It's not the best at everything, but you can do almost everything with it and it's cheap and, uh, and it sounds good, right? And you can't break it. And this bit, the windscreen, this is the bit, like if you knock it over a bunch of times, it might get dented, but even these are replaceable. So you just replace this part, right? You don't even have to, you could just use it like this too, without the windscreen. So this is the SM58, it's a dynamic microphone. So now that we have it apart, let's look at its, uh, its brother here, the SM57. So they're both made by Shure, they're both pretty much the same thing, but take a look, the SM57 is a little bit longer. Otherwise, they're pretty much the same, right? They have the same circuitry inside. This one's got a windscreen, this one doesn't. They're about the same price. I think the SM57 here is like 10 bucks cheaper than the SM58. And I think if you need a replacement windshield, it's like 10 bucks, so it kind of makes sense. So these are, are very popular. You use this mic for a live performance if you're a singer. You could put it on an acoustic guitar if you wanted to. Um, you could use this mic as a podcast mic, a broadcast mic. You could use this mic for voiceover work, um, really anything. So these are the mics that you see at press conferences when there's a bunch of mics, you know, four or five of them are usually these, right? They're also good. This one in particular, because it doesn't have the windscreen, this is good to put in tight spaces. Like you could put this right up to a snare drum if you want to, like an inch away from it. And uh, that's how you would use it in that scenario because you would want the signal, the loud, loud signal to overcome any of the noise around it. So you can get really, really close to something with a mic like this, a uh, guitar amp, for example, and reject all the other sounds. So they're cardioid. You can tell that they're cardioid. It says it right on it. See, there's this little heart shaped pattern. That's the cardioid polar pattern. So what cardioid means is if you remember the polar pattern um, chart that we had earlier, cardioid looks like a heart kind of. So there's a heart shaped area where the back of the heart is around where I'm speaking, right? And then it rejects all the noise that's behind it and all the noise that's, well, not all off to the side, like this side, but off to the side behind a little bit, it rejects. Right, so this is very, very useful on stage if you've got four or five performers all singing into a microphone. You don't want them all coming through each other's microphones. Very, very important. And that's one of the first decisions you have to make if you're going to buy a microphone. Right? So there's a couple key decisions that can help because there's so many microphones. Which one do you buy? The first question you have to ask is what's the polar pattern? Like, What are you going to point it at? What's the purpose of the mic? Is it just for you? Are you going to be in your studio alone? that opens up more options than if you're gonna be on a stage at an open mic or if you're gonna work with a band. You have to think about what you're gonna point it at and what else is gonna be around it when you're using it. And that can help you decide which polar pattern mic to get. You probably want a cardioid mic. Most mics that, uh, that we see out in the wild, as Jen likes to say, are, uh, are cardioid mics. So these are very famous ones. Let's look at some of the other ones that you might find out and about. This one here is by Blue. This is a USB microphone. So this is interesting. This is modern, obviously. It has changeable polar patterns on it. So it could be cardioid if you wanted to. It could also be omnidirectional, like the early, early mics where we just put it on the table 
and then we have people sit around the table and it picks up everybody equally, right? We could do that, or we could turn it into figure eight. And if we had it in figure eight, then I could sit here and somebody could sit across from me and we could both be picked up, but anybody that was on the sides or any noise that was happening on the sides would be rejected by the microphones. So this gives us a lot of options and then it's one unit and we can change all those polar patterns and have some, some different uses. But you wouldn't put this up next to a snare drum. You just physically, it's too big. It doesn't even make sense to do, right? You'd use this. So having different mics for different purposes is important. So this mic's also got some other circuitry in it, right? This is more than a microphone. This is a today circuitry electronics, you know, masterpiece. Um, well, it's not a masterpiece. It's kind of a piece of shit. But if you think about the technology that it's in it, it blows your mind, right? So you use one cable, the USB cable, and that provides all the power this thing needs. And inside this thing, it has its own kind of modeling technology. It's got an EQ built in and it's got a compressor built in and you can change the reverb on it. And it's, it's kind of, it's an interface as well as a microphone. So this is made for convenience for podcasters and for people that are doing um, like home movies and stuff like that. Not good for studio applications or live applications. It's just not. Here we have a Sennheiser mic. This is a wireless microphone, like uh, the lapel mic that I'm speaking to you through right now. It's actually the same system, so I could use either one. I could use this lapel mic, or if, if this was for a speech or something, or if we were doing this at a, you know, somewhere else, this could just go in your mic stand and people could walk up to the wireless signal and we wouldn't have to run a cable anywhere. So that's very helpful. This is a dynamic mic, just, just like this, right? And it's omnidirectional, and I can tell that it's omnidirectional because it says it right on it. There's a circle. It's omnidirectional. That's the polar pattern. They put it on the mic. It's that important. I'm, gonna, I'm just showing you from, from right to left because that's the order they're in. This mic is interesting. It's kind of an experiment. So this looks like, I mean, kind of, it looks like your run-of-the-mill dynamic microphone that you hold in your hand and you speak into, but it's not. This is actually a condenser microphone, which kind of makes no sense. Um, it's a condenser microphone in a handheld body, and they tried to make it so that you could sing into this and hold it, but it's, the thing about the condenser microphone is it's super sensitive. It's not made for that. Like the, it's, too, it's too sensitive for that, so this is very noisy to use. It's not a good microphone. I got it because it was interesting and super cheap, but I would use this for absolutely nothing. It sounds bad. It's not a good mic. So if you got a ma bad mic, don't use it. This mic here is purpose built, right? This is, a, this is for a specific purpose, and that purpose is measuring the acoustics of a room. So most of these mics are all made to make you sound good in some way, right? They'll, they boost the good qualities and they tone down the bad qualities. This particular mic is made to be super, super flat and it's made to measure sound. Um, so I use this to measure where I place my speakers and where I place my acoustic absorption. And this can be used to take a model of a room like we talked about the convolution uh, impulse response reverb a little bit ago. This is the type of instrument that they would use to do that, that kind of modeling. Right, so they put this up. It, it sits like this with the capsule facing straight up and it's omnidirectional in all directions, right? And they use this to measure the impulse response or the amount of time it takes the sound to bounce off the walls in an area. Pretty interesting, it's pretty weird. Now we're getting into cooler mics. This is the one, this is the SM7. This you'll see in all sorts of broadcast applications. Remember, we, those of us that are into this for music purposes, we owe all of this technology to the telephone company and to news and broadcast, right? So broadcast is a very important part of music history. So this is the SM7, we talked about it, Shore made it. Um, it's a very, very quiet mic. Like it needs a lot of, it needs a lot of, uh, amplification on the back end in order for it to sound good or you know to sound at all you just wouldn't hear it but this is just a windscreen that sits on top of it and then there's a metal cone 
and the metal cone just it forces you to keep the right amount of distance from the capsule. So I can't get too close to this capsule. I can get close to it, close enough that I can experience a strong proximity effect, right? So I, it can give me that voice of God power, um, but it, it's far enough away that I, I can't do damage to the capsule. So they can use this for like a kick drum. You could put this right up on a kick drum and hit it as hard as you can, and it's not gonna break the microphone. So that's important. Uh, and it forces me to keep the distance. So that, that helps in uh, preventing pops, like the poppy sounds, so does this. And it makes it very good for broadcast applications in the studio, especially just the way that it sits, the way that it hangs, the way that you can move it like this. It's very handy if you have it on a boom stand, more so than this is, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really articulate the same way this does for that kind of application. So this is the SM7. This is the microphone that Michael Jackson used to record Thriller. This is reported to be Anthony Kiedis' favorite microphone from the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, a lot of rock guys use this. Anybody that's a loud singer, a like a uh, screamy type singer, um, uses these types of microphones. Metal bands use these. Uh, probably not Celine Dion, because she's not... She's not loud and aggressive like that. She's not going to be right up on the... Well, she might be right up on the mic, but for a different purpose, right? When you're recording Celine Dion, you're trying to get all the clarity and all the little the lip-smacky sounds and the glisteniness and the perfectness of her voice. This is for screaming rock music into or broadcasting. Here we have just kind of run of the mill this is an AT4040 audio technica microphone and you can kind of see through the grill this is a condenser microphone so we talked about the condenser microphone has a capsule and that capsule is plated with something that's conductive and that can that is charged by power by phantom power so we send power through one of these and it applies a charge to the plating that's in the middle of this you can't really see very well through the grill but it's there um, and that those uh, when I speak into this it moves that plate and that variation the magnetic variation there makes a current that goes through the wire that's how this works doesn't work if you don't have any power though this is not good for a live application I wouldn't use this for a live application because it's too sensitive and I don't want this on a stage unless I'm the only person on that stage in a really nice room then then something like this but not if you're not if you're at a rock club. It's a bad choice, don't do it. Uh, this would be good for voiceover work. This would be good for uh, music applications, um, stringed instruments, acoustic instruments, guitars, cellos, uh, violins, pianos. It wouldn't be my first choice, but you could use it. That'd be a good application for it. So this is an inexpensive mic. I think they're two or three hundred dollars, and it's a condenser mic. It's cardioid. It says it right on it that it's cardioid. Um, that's how I know. And there's a couple buttons on it that can kind of help you out or save you some time. So there's what's called a low cut. And what this does is it just rolls off all the low frequency information that you probably don't want. Like that's probably going to be the sound of your um, uh, air, conditioner, air conditioner kicking on or your refrigerator or trucks driving by or the boominess of you touching the table and then that transferring through to this. If you turn on the low cut, it just cuts off all that low frequency information and it's not a problem anymore. So it can save you some time on the back end because now you don't have to do it in the software. You've already done it to your signal. So you've got the signal the way you want at the microphone. There's also a pad on it. And all this does is reduce the sensitivity. It just turns the mic down a little bit by 10 decibels. That's what it does, which is not, not a little bit. It's quite a bit. So if somebody's really loud, you can engage the pad and now you're good. Now you have some more headroom to turn up on the back end if you have a preamplifier or something that you're putting this through to make it sound better. Now this type of mic goes in what's called a shock mount for, for isolation purposes. This is so if I you know, bump the table, you don't hear a big loud bump like that, right? This puts an, a, a bunch of elastics around the microphone. This is a generic one. It's not the one that came with the mic, so it's hard to get it in. But the, I, the concept is the same, and it works just fine. So. so now we have this in the shock mount, and this is what goes on to our, uh, our mic stand. 
So now if I hit the mic stand or if I stomp too hard, that impact is going to be taken up by the elastics and it's not going to affect the capsule of this microphone because that's how sensitive they are. So we're, we're taking into account the physical vibration around us and trying to reduce that in the microphone with a shock mount. This kind of mic, you don't even need to do that. It's not that sensitive. You can hold this, you can swing it around, you can throw it, you know, you can beat yourself in the head with it like Lemmy or uh, Gigi Allen or somebody like that. Do whatever you want with it. Condenser mic, not so much. Now over here, this is a video mic. Well, it's not really called a video mic. It's called a shotgun mic, but its application is for video. So we can take this uh, wind foamy thing off and you can see this is a shotgun mic. And it's also got its own kind of shock mount. So this isn't elastic, but it's like a, a thin kind of stretchy plastic, I guess. And it's, it's absorbing any sort of impact or movement so that it doesn't get transferred to this diaphragm. And this is made to be super directional, so it actually goes onto my camera. So I would put this on the top of my camera, and it's pointing directly at whoever I might be interviewing or something. That'd be a good purpose for a shotgun mic. So if you're in a loud, crowded place, a courtroom, uh, you wouldn't be in a courtroom, but uh, at the zoo, you're interviewing some, you're, you're doing a documentary about people that work at the zoo, like Joe Exotic and Carol Baskin. And you're at the zoo, and the lions are over there eating somebody's arm and he's screaming but you don't care about that because you're doing the news and there's somebody over there saying that uh, I don't know what they're saying they're very upset because they were fired earlier for no reason they're picket signing there's just a lot of chaos and noise going around but we want to talk to Carol Baskin so we have this on our microphone pointing directly at her mouth and we're trying to reject everything else around her and that's the purpose and this goes straight into my camera and it records into the video file um, through this little one-eighth inch jack, right? So I plug this right into my camera, and then instead of using the camera audio, it would use this. And I can slap that back on, and then sometimes uh, you'll see what's referred to as a dead cat. It's a, just a fluffy thing that you put on top of this to make it even more resistant to the wind outside if you were a news reporter or something like that, and you were in a hurricane. This is good for video people and, and audio, but this is good for a, a lot of purposes, but video people love it the best because you can just take this with you wherever you're going. It's got these two condenser microphones here and they're pointed on this axis. See how close together they are? If you remember back in the first talk we did about phase relationships and phase cancellation, that's why these capsules are so close to each other. So when the sound bounces off of the wall and comes back, it reaches both of these mics at just about the same time, right? If these, mic if these capsules were divided more, then those sounds would reach them at different times and we'd have phase problems. So this is a, a common way to set up microphones if you're using two of them. It just happens to be built in to this mic. Um, this thing's also, I mean, it's more than a microphone. This is a little portable audio interface, so you can record directly to an SD card with this, or I could hook this up to my computer and use it as an interface and like do a Zoom call with it or something. So if I was a teacher trying to, uh, trying to amplify my whole class or something on a Zoom call, this might sit in the back of the room, pick up all the audio and feed it over to, to Zoom or something like that. Or, you know, newscasters use it. You can sit this on a table and interview somebody and then bring it back and do something with it later. But the point is, there's two mics built into this, and the two mics are positioned such that when the sound comes back to them, it hits them at the same time. That's important. And it's giving us, since there's two mics, this is giving us a stereo picture, oh, a very wide image, right? They're both pointing out this way and that way. And if you think about the polar patterns of the mics, they're hearts, and now they're overlapping. So we're getting a very wide, big area for, because we're stereo, we got two speakers, right? So we can put each one to his own side, and that's pretty cool. Now the bigger mics, let's talk about some of the bigger mics. We had a slide for this guy. This right here, this is the AKG C414. 
it started out as the C12 capsule and we looked at all the different revisions that it's had over time. This thing is made to be clean and useful. It's a studio work horse. So if you're from the business world, you may have heard the old adage, nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. Well, that applies to microphones too, right? This is a microphone that you're gonna see everywhere. Nobody ever got fired for buying it, right? It's like a Strat or a Tele. You can't go wrong with a microphone like this. It's time tested and people love it. The thing is about this particular microphone, the C414, is that now there's like 20 different types of them. Every few years they come out with a different one and that'd be fine, but they change the sound pretty dramatically. Um, but this mic is super powerful because if you look at the front of it, give it a second to focus, there's a little button and there's like five polar patterns on there. So I can switch between all those polar patterns and it also allows me to use um, a, a mix of them, like between them. So I can switch to any of these polar patterns and also the ones in between them, which is crazy. So that's a strange thing to be able to do. And then on the back here, I have buttons to adjust the same things that we had on this other condenser mic here. So there's the pad, but I have some steps here. I could pad it by 6 dB or 12 dB or 18 dB. I have control over that. And also the same thing with the low pass filter. I can change here where that filter turns on. It could be 40 hertz or 80 hertz or 160 hertz. Now, if I was doing a, a vocal or a speech or something like that, I would set this to about 80 hertz because that's pretty much where the male voice drops off. I mean, my, most male voices, I'm sure there are some that go really, really low below that, but not mine. So any information below 80 in my voice is just going to be noise from the room and what's going on around me. It's going to be made from airplanes going over and just stuff we don't even notice because our brain filters it out. So we're telling the microphone to filter it out too with those buttons. This is the C414. Pretty famous mic. It's made to be clean, right? We talked about the Neumann mics and the tube mics and the carbon mics, and they all import, impart a character. This is made to not impart a character, right? That's the intention. That's why I have it. Because there are some sources that I don't want to be messed with. That I want to record them as they are, like a female singer's voice. I don't want, I don't want goop on that. I don't want, I don't want what we call warmth on that. I just want clarity. C414. And now, here we have the big dad, big daddy cane. Here we have the big daddy. Let's move this guy out of the way. So this thing, this monstrosity is a tube mic. It's a condenser microphone. You can see the capsule in it. It's in a shock mount. It's tight. That's what she said. Well, it's droopy because it's heavy, but this is a tube mic. So this is a handmade microphone by a guy named Dave Perlman. He makes microphones. It's tough to get tubes now, and if you were going to buy something like the, the famous the famous uh, Neumann U87, that's $4,000, right? That's a lot of money for a microphone. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that if you have that money, but I, I don't and didn't at the time. But I could come up with enough money for this, which uh, it's not, it doesn't sound the same, but it gives me that tube something, right? So there's definitely a sound imparted by the tubes that is not, that it doesn't exist in mics that don't have a tube, right? It gives it a, 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 a creaminess, a, 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 a warmth, a depth, something, something that stands out. Now this mic is not phantom powered. I don't know if you can see this in the frame, but this comes with its own power supply, like all the old mics did. So I have to plug in this power supply, and then this isn't a mic cable that it's plugged into. This is its own proprietary cable, and it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pins. I think it's a proprietary cable. I've never seen one like this before. It's got seven pins. And this cable goes to the power supply. And then from the power supply, I run a mic cable over to my computer. 
That way we get this, the warm sound of the tube, I can send it over to the computer, and then I have some other outbound gear, so I could put this through another tube compressor, and then I'm adding another tube on it, and the sound just gets warmer and warmer and warmer as I do that. Or, you know, what I'm calling warm, someone else might call muddy. So you have to, it's subjective in that respect. But it definitely alters the signal in a way that's additive, right? It puts something into the signal that wasn't there before and it wouldn't have been put there with any of these other mics. So this is a tube mic and they're big, they're heavy, they're kind of fragile and they're a bit of a pain in the ass, right? This is a lot more to set up than the other mics. It's also heavier, so you need a better mic stand because if you put this on just a normal mic stand like you'd see an SM57 on, it's gonna fall over and break your tube. So I have to have this monstrosity just to be able to support the weight of this microphone. Not, it's a great microphone. It's probably not a good choice if you're just doing a podcast. And then I got one more mic on here that we haven't really discussed yet. And this guy is the Shure SM81. Now this is also a condenser mic. The difference is it has a really small diaphragm. So how this came about or how I suspect it came about is before we had the transistor and we were doing all the tubes and stuff and uh, the condenser mics had their own power supplies. It took a lot to amplify the signal, right? Once, once the voltage was generated at the capsule, it took a lot of power to make that signal loud enough to transmit it down the wire. But then in the 1947 or around the 50s when we got the transistor, we were able to make a signal with far, that was you know, way more powerful without generating as much mechanical energy, right? So this has a big diaphragm and when I talk into it, it, generate, it moves a lot. It generates a lot of, uh, of movement and a, lot, a big voltage, I mean relatively big, it's st still small compared to something like this. Um, Sorry, that's wrong. This is actually way smaller than that, but this is a relatively small voltage and uh, and this with its transistor technology, now we can make that capsule smaller. So we don't need as much of a, a mechanical wave. We don't have to be as loud in front of it. Um, it can pick up things that are that are very, very minute. Okay, so this is for detail. This is something that I would use and I do use on every acoustic guitar track that I ever record. This is my acoustic guitar mic. It's like $350. Some of these other mics are way more expensive and you might think that they'd be the best. Like, why don't you use the most expensive mic? And I don't because this one is the best that I've ever found for recording acoustic guitar. All it's got on it, it's got a little um, pad. I can turn this and that lets me pad the sound or not and it has a low pass filter with a couple of steps on it that I can turn. Right. And this is called a small diaphragm condenser mic. So you'd use a small diaphragm condenser mic if you want to do something like this, where you have more than one really close to each other. Right. Here's another example of that. I have a stand here. I don't have two small diaphragm condensers right now. I sold them off because I don't record like that anymore. But this little adapter screws onto the mic stand and just makes it two mic stands. Well, two, uh, two mic holder, right? And it keeps them spaced apart such that we can turn them so that the capsules would be close together like this and hold them in one place so you can get the stereo signal. So you might use two of these if you wanted to record a stereo signal. The thing is, an acoustic guitar isn't really a stereo signal, so I don't record it like it was one. It just makes it more complicated. But experiment. Maybe you like stereo signals. They are used in some popular recordings, but most of the time an acoustic guitar is a mono instrument, so I only need one mic to get it. So that's an overview of the mics here that I have on the table. Um, I'm going to explain to you how I have these set up. And then we're going to listen to some of them, all right? So I have four mic cables coming over to this table right now. Um, it doesn't matter where they're plugged in, what they're plugged into over here. 
But over on the back end, I have all four cables going into my audio interface, the inputs that are on the audio interface itself, right? So they're all going into the same type of, of preamplifier. It's all the same circuitry. They should all be as close to the same on the back end as possible. So when we look at the differences, we're just looking at the difference in the microphone and how the microphone works, not so much what I've got it plugged into over there. Okay, so I wanna explain that right off. Now, I'm gonna be able to control my audio interface from this iPad here. So I have some of the muted and the volume. Um, we're gonna to have to change the gain because each one of these is gonna put out a different level signal and we're gonna to have to normalize those in order to hear them all. So let me fire up the iPad here and I'll show you kind of what I'm working with. And you can see on the left, it's gonna be your left, I think, the leftmost one, the green uh, signal that's moving, that is the signal from my mic, my lapel mic on my shirt. What we're gonna be working with when we talk into these mics though, I'll mute that mic, and these four channels here that, have, that are muted right now, I'm gonna turn those on and we'll, we'll look at each one of those and how that works. But we're gonna take a break, right? Because I need uh, to take a break. <laughs> and then we'll come back and we're gonna listen to these mics and we'll do a couple quick recordings and you'll be able to know what kind of mic you wanna buy and what you need to do what it is you're trying to do, right? That's the point. So let's take 15 minute break. We're gonna come back and we're gonna listen to these microphones. Groovy. All right, so I'm speaking to you right now through this wireless lapel mic, and that's going through my Great River preamp over there and also through a hardware compressor. So that's what you're hearing me speak through. Now I'm gonna cut that signal off and we're gonna listen to just this. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm just gonna turn off my lapel mic and then I'm gonna start turning up the SM57 mic. So I'm reaching into my pocket here. Let's pull this thing out and let's just turn it off. So right now I'm going to turn up the gain of this microphone. It's at 33 and I'm going to put it to, let's turn it up to 40. This is the gain at 40. And now I'm going to turn it up to 45. All right, now we're at 45. So this should be getting louder. Let's go up to 50. Here we are at 50, and now it looks like I'm starting to get into an area where it's a good, strong signal. Let's turn it up even more. Let's go to 55, uh, 54. I hear that distorting, so I'm going to turn it down a little bit. Let's stick it at 50. 50. So here we go. Take a look. We're talking right now through the green channel. That's the one that's moving. That's what you're hearing. And I'm speaking into this SM57. This is a $79 microphone that you can go buy at Guitar Center today if you don't already have six of them in a drawer somewhere. One of the things about this microphone that you're going to notice is let's see how it responds as I move around it. So right now I'm speaking directly into it. You're probably hearing a lot of like pops when I make P sounds. And that's pretty annoying, right? doesn't sound good well that's why we have these pop filters like a device like this so you see these in studios and people put them in front of the microphones so let's see what happens now I'm popping all over the place and if we put this here now all the pops are gone there's no more pops now my voice also sounds a little bit different through the pop filter but the trade-off is worth it because those pops can really ru ruin your recording now when we're working with some of these other mics or even the uh, SM57 that has the uh, the grill uh, that 58 rather that has the grill over it that has some of this mesh built into it where now we don't have the mesh and you can hear the pops and that doesn't sound good right so this is the SM57 where I'm talking straight into it let's back it off a little bit so I'm still talking at the same volume I'm just pulling the mic back a little bit let's pull the mic back you should be focusing on me pulling the mic back do 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 and you can still kind of hear me. I'm getting quieter, obviously. It takes a loud signal to make this thing work. You have to be fairly close to it to get a good signal out of it. But let's hear what happens when I move the mic off to the side of me. So now the mic's going off to the side of me. And, and let's imagine that I'm speaking into a different mic. And here's my other guitar player, right, on the stage. He's over here somewhere. So this mic 
Especially if he get if he goes behind me a little bit. Now this mic, I shouldn't be in the the purview of this microphone, right? So you can't hear it. It rejects the sound from the sides. You should reject reject the side as I go this way too, right? So you're not hearing it the same as you would if I were in the radius of this cardioid or heart-shaped polar pattern. Right? So this is what an SM57 sounds like. I'm going to mute this for a second, and then we're going to listen to the SM58 and see the difference. I'm going to keep everything here the same. I'm at My gain's at 48, plus 48 gain, so we're going to keep it there and plug in the 58. So let's do that. Okay. So... Now we're talking into the SM58 as opposed to the SM57. You can see there's still the pops. If I pop, I can see that I'm clipping the microphone, right? I've actually got this turned up a little bit too much. So let me turn it back down. We said we were at, what, 48, I think it was. It's tough to be exact. Okay, so now we're at 48 on this mic. And you can still hear some pops and stuff, but it does a much better job of getting rid of them because it's just got this foam screen. Now I can take the screen off. That didn't sound good, right? But now that the screen is off, you can hear the difference in the sound. It gets louder, obviously, and you're going to hear more pops. <laughs> now, if I were to take this, you're not going to hear those pops anymore because it's a pop filter. <laughs> it filters out the pops before they get to the microphone. Makes perfect sense. This, if you look inside it, has the same kind of pop filter material. I'll mute it this time so you don't hear that. back to 48. Okay, so this is the SM58. And let's talk into the 57 as well. So I'm going to turn this one down, turn the other one back up. This is the 58, the one with the pop filter. Both very famous microphones. You probably see them all over the place, right? So this is a, these are dynamic type cardioid microphones. Now I'm going to mute them and let's listen to how they sound compared to the condenser microphones. Okay, here we go. So right now I'm talking through this 58, and I've also got our C414 plugged in. But the C414 isn't working. It's not working because I'm not applying any power to it. So that's one of the main differences between these two microphones. This microphone, I don't have to send any power to this microphone because when I speak, it's moving the diaphragm, and the diaphragm is attached to a, a coil, and that coil is moving up and down around a magnet, and that's making our voltage happen, right? So that's what's going on here. Here we need some voltage to assist that, right? We need to electrify the diaphragm itself in order for it to work. So let's turn on what we call phantom power. It sometimes is marked as 48V on your equipment. That turns on a 48 volt signal that comes up through the microphone and powers our condenser microphones. So let's turn that on by hitting the button. I'm going to turn this mic down and this mic up. Now my gain's at 28. Now my gain's at 50. Let's go back to 48. So now I have the same gain settings that I had on this microphone. And I'm speaking through a, uh, a very clean condenser microphone that's set to the same polar pattern. So this is set right now. I can change the settings, but it's set to the cardioid polar pattern. So I'm, s I'm in that range right now. I'm a little bit away from it. You might be hearing some of my pops. right? So. That's why we have pop filters. So we're, we're listening to this microphone right now. It's a condenser mic. You can, he you can definitely hear the difference. I'm sure you can hear the difference between them. I'm not monitoring right now, so I'm not hearing the difference between them. But you get the point. So that's the difference. Let's pop right back over to this just for one second. I'll just turn phantom power off on this mic, and then I'll turn this mic back up. So now we're speaking through the dynamic mic. I'm a lot closer to it. Like I'm right, I'm touching the grill almost with my lips. Uh, so it's louder there. But you can hear the difference, right? I hope you can hear the difference. Now let's pop back over to this mic for a second and listen to a couple of different polar patterns. Because we're only, so far we've only listened to the cardioid polar pattern, which is heart-shaped. And it's what's in front of the mic gets 
picked up with uh, quite a bit of what's around it. So that gives a singer, for example, some leeway to move over here or over here or back here, you know, and singers use that to their advantage to adjust the sound of what they're making come out of the speakers, obviously. So this is a pretty wide pull pattern. We're going to listen to on this mic here. Let's go to omnidirectional and see what that sounds like. And I'll walk around it a little bit and we'll see how it sounds around the room. I apologize if that is popping your uh, your speakers. I don't know of a cleaner way to do it, really. Here we go. So now I'm set to the omnipolar pattern. You probably hear a difference right away. Let me just stand up and walk around. Well, I'm gonna kind of duck walk around a little bit, I guess. So now I'm standing over to the side of the microphone, and you should still be hearing me about the same way. I mean, maybe it's a little bit tonally different but the mic itself should be picking me up from this direction. It's trying to, right? Now I'm standing behind the microphone, okay? And you should be picking me up just as well, pretty much. I'm a little bit farther away because there's a big tripod in front of me, but still, you get the point. So I'm walking around back to the couch now, and you should still be able to hear that whole signal, right? This is an Omni, so everybody around this table, if we have this mic set up, is gonna get picked up equally. Uh, um, uh, if they're at the same distance from the mic, obviously. Somebody that's farther away is not gonna be as loud as somebody that's closer. And bluegrass bands use this to their advantage. Even live, they'll set up one mic like this, and then they'll step closer to it when they're gonna take a lead, and then they step back when they're supposed to go into the background, right? So they use the microphone as part of their instrument, and that's very cool. So that's a reason you might wanna set a mic like this to Omni. Now this is the 414, it's a really good mic, it's made to be very clear and crisp, and, um, and this would be a good choice for that kind of application. Now let's try the figure eight pattern, right? Like a ribbon microphone. I don't have a ribbon microphone to test because um, they're expensive and I don't really have a great reason to have one, but we can put this mic into the figure eight polar pattern. And a lot of mics that you might get at the consumer level at Best Buy or whatever, they have buttons like this where you can switch the patterns usually between Omni, like we're on right now, Cardioid, like we're usually on, and Figure 8, which we haven't tested out yet. Check this out. A fun fact, Orson Welles uh, recorded, I think, War of the Worlds using a ribbon mic at the time that was made by RCA, an American company. So if you think back to the time when radio was getting super popular, Every one of the world's superpowers had their own microphone manufacturing company, and they're all still around today. So Germany had Neumann, and Russia had Octava, and America had, we had Shore, and we had RCA. And uh, who else we got out there? Austria came out with um, AKG. Who else, who else, who else? Rode, I think, is a newer company, and they come out of Australia. So every, every country has its own mic manufacturer. Um, Maybe not every country, but the big superpowers do. And that's pretty cool. So, I was getting distracted. Let's pop over to the figure eight pattern. Here we go. Now we're in figure eight mode. One of the characteristics of figure eight mode is that it, exempl uh, it amplifies the proximity effect. So we talked about the proximity effect a little bit. It's the effect that as, a, as we get closer to the microphone, it makes our voices sound fuller and deeper. Right? It boosts the bass frequencies, just, just happens right? as part of its design. So one of, the happen, one of the things that just happens as a result of the figure eight pattern is that boost happens, right? So check it out. This should be bigger, right? It should sound thicker than a cardioid mic would sound. It's gonna be louder, obviously, it's probably too loud. Let me turn it down a little bit. But this is a figure mic, a uh, figure eight mic, and let's get our pop filter here, and let me be, just be smooth, so. Turn up the gain to about 30 right now, and I'm gonna get right up on it, and you can see what the, what the distance does. So now I'm speaking to it really close, and let me back off a bit. And as I back off, 
you should hear the low end kind of go away a little bit. It might have been boomy before, and now it's not. But the point I'm trying to make is that artists use this to their advantage. So you hear that crooner sound, and they use this mic to help get that sound. So if you have that sound, you might want a ribbon mic or a figure eight mic. All right, so let's check it out. I'm going to walk around to the side of this microphone, and we'll see. Let me turn it back up. Just turn it, turn it back up to 48. Okay, so now I'm gonna take a little walk around this microphone. Let's just go over here to, where's that, nine o'clock? Here I'm at nine o'clock speaking, and I can see in the, in the signal that it's way less than where I was sitting in front of the mic, as it should be, because this part of the microphone should be rejecting the sound. Now I'm gonna walk over to 12 o'clock. So now I'm at 12 o'clock speaking into the other end of the mic, the mic set into the figure eight polar pattern. Right? So you should be able to hear me pretty much as clearly as you could when I was sitting over there at the couch. But when, I sit, when I'm at uh, 90 degrees here, you shouldn't be able to hear me. Well, I mean, you'll hear a little bit because the sound's bouncing off the walls and coming back into the front and back, but you're not gonna hear the direct signal in my voice. Right? So now I'm back over here at nine o'clock and you hear much less of me, right? That's figure eight and that's what you can expect from a figure eight microphone or if you accidentally hit the button on your microphone and turn it to figure eight, that's the kind of result you can expect, okay? Now, I think probably one of the moments everybody's waiting for is let's listen to the tube mic. So what's all the expense and fuss about this heavy tube mic? Well, first off, the thing about tubes is they have to warm up. They work by heat. So we heat up a filament at the bottom of the tube. The tube itself is a vacuum. There's no air in that. Think about if there was air in that and we heated up a filament, it would just burn because the oxygen would, would be, it would promote fire. Having no oxygen, it's not gonna burn, it's just gonna get warm, right? So it gets warm and then when the um, electricity is applied to this grid that they put around, it, it acts as a valve to let the electrons flow through it in one direction. They call that process rectifying. So if you think about an audio signal or like the power in your house, it's alternating current, it goes both ways. When we, when we go through rectifying a signal, we make that current go in only one direction into a direct current. That's what a rectifier does. That's what a tube does. Tubes do that. Um, that's how they work. So. One of the things about the tubes is they have to warm up before you use them. So I turned on the power to my mic before we started here. So this has been on for about an hour. You probably don't need to leave it on for an hour, but like 20 minutes to warm up the tubes if you have tube equipment is standard because they have to be warm. They sound different as they heat up. They sound better when they're warm, right? So the tube, the tube mic I already have plugged into a different input over there. It's in my gray cable, so I'm gonna mute this mic and we're gonna turn on the tube mic, okay? Keep in mind, there's one other thing I wanna point out here. For this mic to work, I have phantom power turned on. If I turn phantom power off, the mic's not gonna work. But for this mic, it comes with its own power supply and I'm not gonna need phantom power, so I'm not gonna turn phantom power on. It's not gonna, it wouldn't hurt anything if I turned it on, but I don't have to. So right now what we have is me speaking into this tube mic. It's made by Mr. Dave Perlman. It's a handmade microphone. I have it set into omnidirectional. So this has a button on here. I can switch it from cardioid to omni. Right now it's an omni. That's okay in a room like this. It's not ideal. Um, especially if you're in a small room, omni is probably not gonna sound good. But I have this option with this mic. And one of the, one of the characteristics of a mic that's in Omni is I can get as close to it as I want. And it's not going to have any proximity effect. Right, there might be a pop there when I hit 
when I made that P sound because that's just air moving into the diaphragm. So when the air hits the diaphragm, if, it hit, if there's a pop, it could sound really bad. It could ruin your recording. You should use a pop filter. I'm going to back off a little bit so we don't make the pops because I'm not using a pop filter. And I'm going to switch this mic. Well, actually, before I switch it, let me walk around it. And let's just demonstrate how the omniness of the tube mic is working. So I should have a pretty solid signal. I'll turn it up a little bit more. That's pretty loud. And now I'm going to walk around a bit in a circle. So you should hear, as I get farther from the mic, what it sounds like. You probably also hear a lot of noise because there's a fan on in this room and you're going to hear that fan because this is picking up sound in all directions. In a, in a recording type environment, we probably don't want our mic to be this sensitive or this um, open to picking up different sounds. Let me walk over to this side and you'll hear the mic in Omni. So I'm just walking around and talking so you can hear what it sounds like as I walk around the mic in Omni position. And now I'm back to where we started. It shouldn't be all that different, really. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn this over to the cardioid pattern, which is what you can expect from a mic like the SM57 or 58. What's what you can expect from most condenser mics or wherever you see either the word cardioid or that little picture that looks like, doesn't really look like a heart. It looks more like a some kind of squashed vegetable, whatever it is. The cardioid pattern, you know what it looks like. It looks like a little brain, an upside down heart, but the heart bit isn't very hearty. I, I think it's a bad analogy. I think it's a bad, it's not a heart, <laughs> okay? Okay, it doesn't look like a heart, but whatever. That's what we call it, that's what we use. Um, I'm switching this right now. Boom, so now we're in the cardioid polar pattern and I see it's too loud so I'm going to turn it down and notice how much I have to play with the gain as I get closer to it and as I move these uh, polar patterns around just how they work right just think about the characteristics the closer I am to it the less volume I can apply to it on the back end right if I back up a little bit I can turn it up more and I'm gonna get a different tone from that. As I back up, I don't need the pop filter as much. But if I get this close to the microphone and I start making B sounds and P sounds, that's just going to blow air into the diaphragm and it's going to make popping sounds that, that distort and sound terrible. And there's, they make tools like uh, forensic tools and repair tools to try and de-click things. But the, the trick is not to get the clicks into your recording in the first place because all of those tools will leave over artifacts and stuff. And not only does it take your time to try and clean it up, but you, you stomp on the signal. So you want the cleanest, best signal you can get. So record it the best way you can with whatever it is that you have. Right. Okay, so now uh, let me turn it up a little bit more. Okay, I'm gonna walk around. We're in the, the cardioid polar pattern right now, and I'm just gonna do a little once around like we did before. So now I'm off to three o'clock. You should still hear me, maybe kinda. I'm like 90 degrees to the capsule, and now I'm a little bit behind it. Okay, so now I'm at like 11 o'clock. And now I'm directly behind it. I'm behind the camera. I'm at 12 o'clock. I'm maybe uh, four feet back from the mic. So what you're really hearing right now is the sound of my voice bouncing off of the wall. What's not coming back from the, uh, from the acoustic absorption back there into the microphone. You're not hearing it come from my voice or you're hearing very little of it come directly from me. And now we're back to the, the front, right? Cool. So that's the tube mic. That's how the tube mic, work, mic works. Let's listen to some of the other mics here. So I'm gonna turn this one off. So here we are. I've got the SM7B. Now this is the mic that I use most often. This is what I have at my desk to do podcasts or to do um, these things. To I mean, today I'm using the lapel mic so I can walk around, but usually I'd be using this microphone for anything where I'd be doing just straight speech because it's convenient. I like. I just like it. All right, it works. It sounds great. There's there's a couple of buttons on the back. Um, it's a little switch where you can set the the filter, the high pass filter on this. 
but I don't mess with it much. It just does what I need it to do. This is what it sounds like, and as I get closer to it, I should sound a little bit bassier, and as I back up from it, that bass should go away, and I should sound more natural sounded, but I gotta turn it up. Right now I have the gain at 54, and that's not as loud as the other mics, right? You need a lot of gain to be able to use this microphone. It's very, qu it's very quiet. So now I'm at 63 which is about as, this is about maxed on my audio interface. This is about as high as I can go. Um, so to make this mic sound good, it requires a preamp on the back end that can get loud without getting too noisy. Because that's one of the big problems with these types of microphones is you have to turn them up a lot. And if you're using a lot of the cheaper gear, when you start turning things up a lot, you start hearing a lot of noise. Same thing with the old school... Uh, tubes and carbon stuff they were very uh, noisy they did they were really really noisy especially compared to today's standards where everything's super clean and it's all silicone and transistors and there's no um there's no natural like buzzing of of magnets and stuff and there's no moving parts it's just clean um all right so this is a great microphone. It usually hangs upside down like this from a boom stand like I have over there. And it has to be really heavy because it's a really heavy microphone. So is that tube microphone. So if you're going to start using microphones like these, you need a really good mic, mic stand. And those can be upwards of like 150 or 200 bucks. So if I put this mic on a $20 Guitar Center mic stand, it's going to fall over. But because of its construction, I'm not that... I'm not that concerned about this mic this mic would be fine if it fell over that mic would not right that mic would would be in bad shape so if you're going to start using these bigger heavier mics you, you have to invest in a good mic stand or you're going to be a sad panda a sad 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 panda so that's this mic uh let's listen to this this mic this um 40 40 i don't think we've listened to this mic yet so i have a couple different of the same type of microphones for different reasons and then the reason is their character right this is a much darker sounding mic than this one is so if i need if i'm recording somebody that has like a, a high voice or a piercy kind of voice i don't want to accentuate any of the brightness in that voice by using a bright clean microphone i want to use something that sounds dark that's going to tone down that high end and make maybe the lower end where their voice is more flattering i want to i want to pay attention to that more so i'm using my microphone selection based on what i'm trying to record um, so i can get the sound as close to the way that i want it in the recording right out of the mic right that saves work it saves time it makes the end product of higher quality because there's less stomping on it along the way and it's in everybody's interest to get it right at the source so i have a dark microphone and i have a bright microphone and i have a tube microphone and i have standard microphones and i have this small one we'll listen to this too and you'll hear the difference between this guy and this guy uh, a small diaphragm condenser and a large diaphragm condenser right now what we're listening to is the Shure SM7B. This is the broadcast microphone of choice for many, many people. Anthony Kiedis loves this microphone. Michael Jackson used this microphone to record Thriller. Now we're going to switch over to the small diaphragm condenser mic. Slowly, slowly. Here we go. I'm at 40 right now. That seems to be about good right now. I'm at 50. That's too much. Let's back off go back to here's 36 so I can get kind of right up to the microphone at 36 I shouldn't in this without my pop filter so now if I have a pop filter I can talk into this microphone so this is a small diaphragm condenser mic right it's also referred to let me turn it up a little bit more okay this is a small diaphragm condenser mic. It's also referred to sometimes as a pencil mic because look at it, it looks like a pencil. You can get this in really tight spaces, which is nice. And it, it picks up a really nice, clean, clear signal. Now this is made by Shure. It's called the SM81 and it's made to record instruments mainly. So you can record strings, cellos, acoustic guitars, um, cymbals for a mic kit. Those are the types of things that you might want to record with a mic like this. Now, you could record an acoustic guitar, 
with a mic like that, and it could sound great. And a lot of great recordings are recorded that way, but it definitely has a different sound than if you were to use one of these microphones because they're more sensitive, they're more in, in key to the very minute details of something as opposed to this, which is trying to... It also gets a lot of detail, but it's not... Um, uh, uh, it doesn't have the same kind of resolution, if you will, if that makes sense. So let's, let's listen to this, my voice, in this, and then that mic too. All right, here we go. Just turning this one up just a little bit more, and then let's get some power going on to this mic. Remember, both of these are condenser mics. They don't have their own power supply. I'm turning on power over here using my interface to get them to work. Okay. So right now, I'm speaking to you through this C414. It's a large diaphragm condenser mic. Here we have the Shure SM81. This is a small diaphragm condenser mic. If I put them at about the same place, right, let me just switch between them. So I also want you to note the, the volume difference that I have set, the gain that I have set between these two mics. So on the 414 that we're listening to right now, I have the gain set at 47. Now let's turn that mic off and we'll turn this mic on. Okay, here we go. Now I'm talking through the other microphone. This is the, uh, the 81, and it's also set to 47. Let me turn it up a little bit, because I'm kind of far away from it. So now I have it set at 55. This is, I hope that you can hear the difference. I'm not monitoring, and I've actually never performed this test before, so I hope that you can hear a clear difference between the two. So I would use this pencil mic to record something like an acoustic guitar. I wouldn't use it to record a vocal. I just wouldn't. Right, I'd use this to record a, mo a vocal, or I'd use this, or I'd use the tube mic, or I'd use the other condenser mic that I have over there, right? or even just an SM57. Pretty much anything would be better than this pencil mic for a vocal. If we're talking about an instrument, it makes a lot more sense to use something like this. It's a little bit more directional in its design. Like You can get a lot closer to something with it and it picks up finer details so let's I'm gonna go grab my guitar and we'll listen to how it sounds and I'll throw this mic in this so I don't have to hold it and I'll put them both at about the same spot okay and I'll grab the guitar and we'll hear how it sounds on a different um, medium right on a different sound source in tune for a guitar I just tuned. So this is the C414. Let's switch it over to the small diaphragm condenser mic and play just diddle like that. Go. Now we're on the small diaphragm condenser mic. So you can hear the difference in the microphones, right? I hope you can hear the difference in the microphones. Let me take a look here at what time it is so I don't get too lost. It looks like it's about 12.30. Cool. So I want to do a couple more tests so you can hear what it sounds like when I play guitar with the SM57, right? Because that's probably a good 
entry into this kind of world if you're not already invested in microphones and stuff and you don't have a microphone at all that might be what you're working with is an sm57 so let's hear what that sounds and how we can get a decent sound out of it right because that's a cheap way to do it okay here we go so the lapel mic's back in action excellent so now you've heard the difference between some of these and you can i hope hear why i would choose the sm81 as my um, instrument microphone or as my guitar microphone because it, it's easy to point where I want to point it which on the guitar if I'm, mic if I'm micing up a guitar is going to be here on the 12th fret I'm going to be pointing it like pretty dead on to the 12th fret that's going to give me a mix of the sound because there's a set of sounds coming from an acoustic guitar you have the low end and the the body of the guitar coming from the sound hole and the but the it's actually coming from the um, the movement of the uh, what the hell you call this? The top, right? The top of the guitar is vibrating and making that sound, and the sound hole is just acting as a resonator. But we also get a lot of the sounds that we like from the guitar from this side. That's the finger noises, the sliding, the the. Uh, you can hear my finger hit the string when I hammer and pull. There's a little bit of clickiness to it, right? So when we take the microphone like this and point it right at the twelfth fret here, it's about the halfway point and we're able to pick up a balanced, um, balanced representation of the guitar, which is what I'm going for. Now, depending on the guitar, you might m just, all you have to do is move the microphone a little bit. If you want it to be bassier, move the microphone a little bit towards the bassier end of the guitar. Not even a lot, like a quarter of an inch turn can be, make a big difference, right? Or you can move it the other way, or you can move it closer or farther away. So this is a very good starting point no matter what kind of microphone you have, if you're going to try and record an acoustic guitar, like me and a lot of my other friends do, that's our primary instrument. So this is kind of why we have microphones in the first place, is to record the acoustic guitar. Um, okay, cool. So I'm looking for that 57 I had a minute ago, and we're going to set that up, and we're going to record some guitar, and I'm going to get a pick, and we'll, uh, we'll do it for real. But right now, I seem to have misplaced that microphone. I had it, we were talking through it, and then I smoked a bunch of pot, and then I started getting rambly about microphones and about the construction of the 1920s. Oh, there it is, it's behind my iPad. Here we have it. So this is the guy we're gonna use. We're gonna take this microphone, I'll throw it right up on the table. Okay. And then we're gonna record some acoustic guitar. Now, I just want to make, an, I want to say one more time, this mic that we're talking through right now is on my shirt. It's a little lapel mic that's using that little wireless transmitter you've seen me fiddling with. Now, that's an omnidirectional microphone. So if I click, it should be just as clear as if I click over here. It's picking up the sound in all directions because it doesn't know which way I clipped it. It doesn't know where I pointed it. But it, it, so it might not be a good choice for you if you're outside and there's wind coming from all the directions or if you're in a loud crowded building it's not as good as like even your apple ear pods would be because you could use those and those are built to reject that kind of sound this is not this is built to include that sound so keep that in mind and let's get fired up here for the sm57 off of the decade We'll use the yellow cable. And this guy is the wrong size for the SM57 because this is for the smaller pencil mics. SM57 is a little bit wider than the SM81. They're both made by Shure. Like most of the mics that I use are made by Shure. They're great mics and they made them for a long time. And I've had them for a long time. These aren't n new acquisitions for me. I've had these for 10-15 years.
So this is probably what you might find at an open mic or a coffee house or even on a podium if you're giving a speech or a wedding or something like that. Pretty common. Now keep in mind, as we demonstrated with the other mics, the closer you get to it, the more likely you are to make popping sounds. So you might want to have something like a pop filter or some kind of screen in front of it if you're going to use this to talk into. That's just something to keep in mind. Now let's get, I'm going to cut off my, uh, my lapel mic and let's get some power to this guy. So now I have the volume of this SM57. It's turned up all the way. This is as loud as I can go because it needs a lot of power to drive it. So let's get my guitar and hear how it sounds. That's the kind of sound you could expect from an SM57 turned up all the way on the preamps that come built into my audio interface. Now, that's not how I would use the, the 57 if I were recording with it here. I would put this mic through one of my other preamps, like my Great River or the Pacifica or something like that. Because when you take these mics and you put them through those good electronics, it turns them into something else entirely. And that's a whole different set of gear that's imparting its character onto the sound of your signal just because of the electronics that are, are used in it, right? The less electronics we have in the signal path, the less they add to the signal path. But the thing is, we love the sounds that they add to the signal path. So sometimes we integrate those back in by, by integrating our outbound gear, like my preamp and compressors. So this probably sounds a bit noisy. It probably sounds kind of shrill because uh, it's it's cheap inter well it's not a cheap interface but the preamps in the interface are cheap they're meant to be a, um i don't want to say a last resort but they're a convenience thing most people using an interface like this are going to be using external preamps now they're still way 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 better than they ever were in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s you could buy something for 25 30 40 dollars that's going to blow away anything elvis ever touched right just because of technology and how quickly it progressed fueled it was really the progression of it was fueled by the broadcast industry and by the wars which i find industry interesting because we got all this stuff the all the of us that love music and use these microphones we got all this stuff because the guys during world war ii wanted to be the loudest voice in town <laughs> that's really what drove all this innovation of all the stuff we're using is they just wanted to sound better than everybody else so they invested all, a lot of money into R&D to make microphones and microphone technology to make their sound authoritative and we owe a lot to that um, a lot of this was driven by that and those early radio guys so this has been an overview of microphones and how microphones work. This is one part of the signal chain, right? We talked way or a couple weeks ago, we talked about just the physics of sound and how sound waves work and interact in your room. And then we talked about routing and cables and stuff and how that works and how we move the signals around. And now we've talked about microphones and how they work and the different types of them. And next we're going to talk about some other types of gear like equalizers and compressors and the types of... Um, broadcast tools that were developed to help people use the newfound technology that we were developing in radio and television. Um, so that's pretty exciting. And we're going to talk about some famous compressors, uh, famous equalizers, how they were designed and why, and what's still used today and what's replaced a lot of these things. So that's what we're going to talk about next week is EQ and compressors. And that's going to be fun. So stay tuned. Um, see you next week and we're going to talk about 
EQ and compressors. I hope this was good. I'm excited to watch it myself and see how it sounds because it was kind of an experiment. So let me know if it worked out. I bet I popped your eardrums a few times, uh, but I hope it was worth it. So have a good week, and it was good hanging out with you. Bye bye